All right, I'm live, and I put the wrong date on it. You got to love that. Okay. It's taking care of the links. Good times. Hello, viewers. It's two of you. I'm just spacing out. I was doing the um, the links. There we go. Yeah, that's up. Watching the thing. Okay. Going into another book so that we have something to read. And this is a good one. It's 9:29. I'm gonna stick to my schedule, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ambitiously read 39 pages. Now, an English teacher of mine once said that we kind of, kind of, between books, you should take time to think about them, digest them. And I think that's actually right. But also, that teacher gave me this advice before the advent of YouTube, where I can read this out loud and you can listen to it later. So, um, we have a whole full three of us here now, and it's 9.30. So, I've got to stick to my schedule. Road trip. Well, it's kind of weird with the visual, right? It's like road trip, road trip. Um, by Gary Paulson. The plan. Are you sure this is a good idea? Absolutely. Why? Because I'm your father and I said so. That's really lame. Yeah, but it works. We're going. That's what I thought. I lean up against the pickup in our driveway and watch Dad shove the road atlas in the glove box without even looking at it. Checking freeway numbers and plotting a route beforehand would be too traditional for him. He knows which direction he's heading and how to find the main freeway out of town. He'll figure out how he's getting there and how he's going when he gets closer to getting there. That is how Dad rolls. I don't roll like that, though. Not me. But I usually wind up going along for the ride. And this time, it's literally. Dad's always coming up with ideas for things to do together. Rock climbing, sculpting class, fencing lessons, poetry slams, whitewater rafting, camping trips. You name it. You'd think I'd be used to the spur-of-the-moment plans by now. But the clock on the dash says it's 5.17 a.m., and then I didn't expect to be up this early the first day of vacation. Dad shook me awake a few minutes ago and pulled me out of the driveway, talking nonstop. We have to get on the road right now this very minute. Hurry up. We're burning daylight. We got to hit the road. I yawn. I rub the sleep out of my eyes. I mean, it's 517 in the morning. There's a border collie pup, he says, who needs us. A border collie pup who needs us. I just got an email from someone in a rescue group. We're going to bring him home. We already have a border collie, and his name is Atticus. And we foster them sometimes when we're between homes because I know how awesome they are. I love all dogs, even if they're ugly or yippy or drool. I love even the old ones and the wadly ones. But border collies are extra special. They're not like dogs. They're more like control freaks with paws. They've been bred to herd sheep for generations. And even if they haven't been born and raised on a sheep farm, border collies are always trying to keep everybody and their entire world in check. Another border collie is definitely a good idea for someone like Dad. And maybe this one will like me best. Atticus has always preferred Dad to me, even though he pretends not to. Well, I can't blame him. Atticus was part of the family before I was born. Give me 15 minutes so I can get packed, I said to him. Packed? You're not going for a grand tour of the capitals of Europe? Couple of days. There and back. Already, 
I already threw skivvies and a toothbrush and a clean t-shirt and shorts and a paper bag for you. A sweatshirt too. You're good to go. Let's go. I look at the crumpled bag he's tossed on the floor of the truck. I'm not at all sure that's everything I might need, even if it's just a two-day trip like he promises. I start a mental list. Snacks, water bottle, a book, my iPod, the charger, my laptop, sunglasses... Travel light, Ben, so you can move fast. That's what I always say. He won't even let me brush my teeth or take a shower before we leave. I sleep in gym shorts and a t-shirt. He considers me dressed. He does not let me slip on a pair of flip-flops and grab my phone and charger from the kitchen counter. He's revving the engine and has started edging away from the garage. So I hop in the truck and I slam the door and he whips down the driveway in reverse. The house is a blur as we leave. How do you think Atticus is going to deal? I tip my head toward my 15-year-old border collie sitting between us on the seat. He's staring holes through the windshield as if he's responsible for memorizing the entire route and is making note of landmarks and directions. I'm not sure how Atticus will react to a new dog in the family because I don't think he considers himself a dog. I get the feeling Atticus believes he's more of a person He's old and he's crabby, plus he ignores other dogs if they approach him. So I'm a little worried about how he's going to live with a new puppy. Dad laughs. Oh, he'll hate it, but they'll have to work it out. That's his motto. Oh, it'll work out. I pull out my phone and I take a picture of Dad and Atticus in profile. Ever since our photography class, I take a lot of pictures, actually. I post them on my Facebook page. What did Mom say when you told her we were taking off? Mom runs a tight ship. She's very organized, but she's a lot more flexible than a border collie. It makes sense that I'd have worried about Atticus's reaction before I thought about how Mom would take it. I'm going to stop by Colonel Munchie's on the way out of town. He screeches around the corner and he jerks the truck to a stop in a parking lot. He jumps out and he says, I'll call your mother while I'm grabbing supplies. Ah, he didn't tell Mom. She probably would, have, would not have been happy that we were taking a trip before we cleaned the gutters and painted the garage. So I'm pretty sure Dad's timed the call, hoping Mom will be in the shower before she goes to work and he can just leave a message. But I bet she woke up and realized they were gone and she's been sitting at the kitchen table, drumming her fingers and waiting for the phone to ring. For a second, I'm worried that Mom might actually put an end to our puppy rescue. Or at least delay it until we get the stuff on her chore list checked off. But then I see Dad stagger out of the convenience store, loaded with enough junk junk to keep us fed halfway across the continent. And he nearly drops the phone as he flashes the thumbs up sign. Nice. Dad's getting good, getting people to think think from his perspective. Sorry. Plus, Mom loves dogs as much as Dad do. Our sudden exit was the only wild card. Mom and I aren't good with the unexpected like Dad is. Atticus makes a noise. He's watching Dad on the phone. Puts his head to the side and flattens one of his ears. He's skeptical. And Dad's not so good at getting Border Collies to see things from his perspective. So now the the book has Atticus. This is the dog. So this one page is the dog talking. I wasn't paying full attention when Boss and my boy were talking before we left. They were getting... Near the truck, and the only thing on my mind was getting in the front seat before they left without me. They forget sometimes, and they try to drive off without me. When that happens, I sulk. I chew a sock, and not a good one, though. But next time, they'll think twice about forgetting me. The boss is driving too fast. He always does this when he's excited. My boy has no idea what's really going on. I do, though, and I'm worried. Plus, I don't want a dog. Getting a dog's a terrible idea. Dogs are not my favorite things. Dogs are messy and needy. He's a dog talking, remember? But the boy should have a dog, I suppose, because boys like dogs. But dogs are a lot of work, and I know this one will not understand the order of things at home. Maybe they'll forget about getting a dog. The boss does forget things. That's why I always have to remind him to take me in the truck. And that was Atticus, the dog talking, for one page. So now we're back to... Chapter 2. Dad hops in the driver's seat after stowing supplies in the back seat of the cab. Instead of roaring out of the parking lot to hit the highway, 
He turns to me and he clears his throat. <clears throat> ben, I have something to tell you. Uh-oh. Uh, good news never has come from that serious tone. I quit my job yesterday. It's funny how five little words like that can make you go numb all over. I hold my breath, waiting for him to continue, and I hope to get to the good part. I can't continue existing in a soulless, mid-level corporate drone existence. He talks like he thinks I'm going to understand this. Well, I guess that's not right, I say cautiously. I was suffocating behind a desk. I need to get out in the real world and start working with my hands. Okay... I started my own business. You did? I struggle to remember exactly what Dad does for a living. I don't even know. He's vice president in charge of something for an insurance company. Mutual Fidelity Unlimited. I know that much because all the pens lying around the house that say that. Flipping houses. That's my business. Excuse me? I look at the clock. It's 5.47 a.m., this is a pretty big change to take in before six in the morning. He has so much news. Has so much news ever come my way in such a short amount of time? We're going on a road trip. We're getting a new dog. Dad quit his job and is starting a new house, a business called Flipping. I'm dizzy. You buy low. You renovate. You sell high. It's a no-brainer. Okay, I think so. You're going to remodel houses. Like that show on TV. Dad actually can fix or build anything. He's great at that. But he's not great at finishing things. Not remodel. Renovate. Uh, what's the difference? Civic responsibility. Making the world a better place. One crummy neighborhood at a time. The plan is I go into a rundown area. Buy a house in rough shape. After I renovate. Not only will I provide a, a family. A top of the line new home. And make a profit. But I'll have raised the market value of the entire neighborhood at the same time. What do you mean crummy neighborhood? I bought our first place on 15th and Humboldt. You bought a crack house. We bought a crack house. Duffy and Son. That's the company name. Nice, huh? And it's for legal purposes. And by the way, the former is an alleged crack house. Well, that makes all the difference. You already bought it? I, I had to move and fast on it. Well, I bet former lead crack houses are very popular, Dad. I was sure you'd be more excited about this. I, I was counting on your support. Uh, fast chance. Does Mom know? Of course she knows. And? She's not happy. Define not happy. Your mother's problem is that she's looking at us from the wrong angle. What the angle should she be looking at from, Dad? This is the start of a brand new chapter in our lives. Dad's delusional. I feel worse. Good chapters hardly ever start with houses where drugs have been sold, Dad, okay? That's what makes it so cool. It's completely unexpected. That we can agree on. The future is ours, Ben. There's no limit what we can do with this opportunity. Where'd you get the money? The other day, Mom said we couldn't stretch the budget to afford the new laptop I want. Lately, we've been eating more leftovers, and she runs around turning lights off in empty rooms. She's been trying to talk to Dad about the bills. Uh, they don't think I notice that he's been sleeping in the guest room lately. Dad's phone rings. He looks down and tilts it toward me so I can see Mom's picture. The second he hits the button, I hear her... Getting ahead of yourself. Wish you told me first. Dad shrugs and starts to take the truck and gets out of the truck to take the call. Before he shuts the door, I hear him tell, we'll work it out. I wonder if mom is just as jumpy as I am. Okay, I never gave much thought to what dad did for a living or whether it made him happy. Still, the fact that he quit his job and bought a crack house to fix up is a little terrifying. It's kind of selfish, too. I watch him pacing the Colonel Munchie's parking lot, phone to ear. He's doing, what a, he's doing a lot of listening. He catches my eyes, and he makes his right hand into a beak and taps his fingers and thumbs together so I understand. Mom is talking his ears off. He gestures at me to take the phone. I shake my head, no way. 
even though I'm curious to hear what she has to say. I grab a half-empty bag of red licorice from the dash, and Atticus and I share them for breakfast while we wait for them to figure this out. I adjust the radio to a news station. We listen to international events. Some old, same old, economic sanctions, overthrown governments. By comparison, our day is relatively peaceful. It's all a matter of perspective, is what I say to Atticus. Atticus yawns and looks unimpressed. Yeah, you're right, I say to him. When you compare your day to wars and marketplace collapses and this, uh, to find the upside, you're, you're, you're not in good shape. We chew another piece of licorice together and we watch Dad head back to the truck. She thinks the road trip's a good idea. Sure she does. Mom likes her space when she's mad, actually. And I bet she's mad enough to hope Dad stays on the road all summer. I'm a little surprised, though, she didn't insist that he bring me back home. Even for Dad, this business idea and sudden trip is off the rails. One more thing, Dad says in a voice that makes my stomach do the alley-oop thing. Um, I wish I hadn't eaten all that licorice. We're going to have to live close to the bone for a while until the profits start flowing in. And we might have to cancel a hockey camp next month. He did not just say that. We've been talking about hockey camp since I was five years old. I got my first pair of skates. I'm finally good enough to hold my own with other players. I pulled straight A's all year. That was the deal. When I'm 14, if I get the grades, I can go to hockey camp for six weeks. I know you're bummed. It kills me even to think that I might have let you down. But for the time being, even with your mom working and me putting everything I've got into this new business to make it a success, there's a possibility I might not have the cash and time to send you. Mom would never let me down like this. What did she say about hockey camp? She agrees we can't afford it right now. So neither you care that I killed myself to get these grades for nothing? No wonder Mom didn't make me come back home. You have to look at the bright side. There's still a chance everything's going to work out. How big a chance, Dad? He ignores that question. It's definitely you can go next summer. You'll be able to go every summer once the business starts turning a profit. I know it will. Our deal, Dad, was this summer. You'll have to work with... You'll be working with me. It'll be great. No one else is going into business renovating houses with their dad. I don't build houses. I play hockey. That's why we're going on this road trip, to spend some quality time together. Talk about business and to get you the dog. You think a dog is going to make up for a missing hockey camp? A dog makes up for everything. Quotable. A dog makes up for everything. (gasps) Not even close. I feel disloyal to Atticus saying that, though. But I'm really resentful. Atticus has been sitting between me and Dad is looking back and forth as we speak. He can tell something bad is happening. Dad's still talking and I've actually just stopped listening. Ice is the only place I feel comfortable and the teammates are the best friends I have. They're all going to camp. The summer is going to be miserable. Dad's voice changes and I start listening again. I hate to say it, Ben, but I'm disappointed in your attitude. You're disappointed? That's rich. My parents double-cross me and then criticize me for being bitter. Before I can ask him how I'm supposed to tell my team that I'm not going to camp with them, like I said, Mom calls again. This time he waits to get out of the truck and he shuts the door before answering. This trip stinks like rotten eggs and untreated sewage and little green olives with red things stuffed inside. The last thing I want to do is to be stuck in a pickup truck with my dad for two days. But watching him talk to mom on the phone, I realized I'd be more miserable at home with her because dad's, she's mad at dad and she's worried about money and she would make me paint the garage. At least I'll get my own border collie if I go with dad. I actually have been wanting that, a dog that belongs just to me. I have a list of possible names. Zamboni, Carome, Stanley. Uh, Nothing says like, they're all ice hockey names if you haven't noticed. And nothing says I have to talk to him or listen to him go on about the business. I'll go, but I'm not going to like this. No reason to be on my best behavior if hockey camp is out of the picture. And no matter how many maybes or mites he throws in, my guts tell me I'm not going. I glance out the window and I snap a picture of Dad on the phone. Might as well photograph the trip. 
When I see the clerk from the store, he comes out. He looks kind of rough around the edges like Theo. Theo. Perfect. Atticus again. This is the dog talking for one page. I'm glad the boss and my boy were talking. I don't think my boy wants to talk to the boss anymore. Then it will be too quiet in the truck and my boss will play outlaw country music on the radio and my ears will hurt. So it's better when they talk. Talking is always a good thing. Even the new house is a good thing. I saw the house. I saw the way his eyes smiled and his shoulders lifted when he walked through it. I don't know why he didn't try harder to tell my boy that he bought the house three months ago. Or that he worked on it night and on the weekends and it's for sale and there's an offer already on it now. The boss can't stand sitting around waiting to see if this works out. That's why we're going on the road trip. The boy didn't notice the boss was always gone and always tired. I noticed. Important revelation from the dog. The house is actually done and on the market and they're waiting on an offer right now. So, whoa, intrigue. Theo's a guy I know from school. Now, now we're back to his voice. He should have graduated this year, but he's missing a few credits. Our guidance counselors hooked us up because I'm a volunteer tutor, and Theo needed someone to help him stay focused. I actually didn't tutor him since he's a few years ahead of me. We just get together and study. It must, it must be working because he's going to graduate next semester. When I first met him, he scared me. I got a, he's got a shaved head and an eyebrow piercing. I'd heard about him at school. They were the kind of stories that do not say future study buddy. But getting to know Theo is actually one of the coolest things that's happened to me. I do all right for myself friend-wise, but no one's knocking people down to hang out with me. Or they weren't until word got out that Theo and I were friends. My stock rose after his street cred rubbed off on me. At least that's what I like to think. I notice a lot more people sitting at my lunch table. Um, this friends, this is what friends of rock stars and professional athletes must feel like. Plus, Theo's just cool. No one else knows I can talk about subtext and dramatic irony of a play. He's reading, and the community standards for curfew violations and truancy. He's been in some trouble, but he's actually a good guy. Atticus loved him right off the bat. Dad got a bad first impression of Theo when he heard me telling my friend Todd that Theo had one of his buddies had been picked for vandalism. But Dad thought I was talking about Theo. He calls him the hoodlum. I never bothered to correct him because I just liked the idea that Dad thought I was hanging out with a juvenile delinquent. Dad hasn't been around much lately anyway. This Theo is exactly what this trip needs. I dial his number. Theo picks up on the fifth ring. He drops his phone, swears a blue streak. 5.56 in the morning. This had better be good. Sorry about the time. It's Ben. Got two words for you. Road trip! As a part of this, I'm really serious about graduating plan. Theo has been doing nothing but studying for months. And he's itching to taste freedom now that summer vacation is started today. He lives with his older brother. I don't know where his parents are. So it's not like his folks are going to say no. Theo's brother's only rule is, don't smoke in the house. When do we leave? We're on our way. Swing by your place in five minutes. I'm good to go, dude. I love Theo. But Dad does not. Which is what makes Theo essential for this trip. The second Dad opens the truck, I blurt out, Theo's coming with us! Dad doesn't say a word. He rests his forehead on the steering wheel. Welcome to my world, Dad. Now we're both miserable. How about somebody different? Like, what about Todd? Let's bring Todd. Todd doesn't have a record. And I've never seen Todd hang with his pants too low, okay? What do you say? Nope. Theo. Is it even legal for him to leave town? Doesn't his electronic ankle... Bracelet go off and alert the cops? You exaggerate. Theo seems rough, but he doesn't have an ankle bracelet, and he's expecting us. Weren't you the one in a big hurry? I can tell Dad does not want to argue, but he also wants to just get on the road. Fine. He slams the truck into gear, zips into the road, and floors it. But I am not. Repeat, not. 
posting bail for a kid if he robs a convenience store or mugs a senior citizen along the way. Understood, Dad. But I don't think theft is his thing anyway. Take it right here. Third apartment building on the left, Dad. Theo standing on the corner, smoking. He flips the butt as Dad pulls up to him. Even though it's a big interior and Theo's in the back seat, his nicotine smell is gagging. Atticus wrinkles his nose and sneezes. He's wearing a sleeveless t-shirt. Excellent. No way Dad will miss the homemade tattoo on his arm. I try to snap a picture. Theo flexes his bicep so his tattoo pops. Ben. Ben's dad. How's it hanging? Call me Mr. Duffy. Can I smoke? No. Not in the truck. Not on this trip. Not in front of my son. Got it. You one of those health nuts? I'm just opposed to carcinogens. Sure. I hand Theo a bag of chips to take his mind off the nicotine fit he might be having. And he starts crunching away. I pass a can of soda hoping he's the kind of guy who does big burps. So, Theo, says Dad. Um, so, blah, 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 okay. He winks at me, his Mr. Insurance salesman. I'm your best buddy, Wink. Um, he's probably hoping he can charm a confession out of Theo that will justify dumping him on the side of the road. Tell me about your school. Ben says you're pulling your grades up. That's an exaggeration. Theo passed all his spring courses, but his GPA isn't anything to get excited about. I've never talked to Dad about Theo's grades. I don't have a good feeling about this. Well, I don't know about that, but I just stopped screwing around. I, I'm getting serious about school. This is not going my way. Impressive. What, a, what about after you graduate? I'm going to go to community college. I'm going to take care of my prereqs, and I'm going to get some decent grades. I think I'm going to try to apply to university. Dad's nodding like crazy. But Theo, my guidance counselor said that with a GPA and a history like mine, that's actually the only plan. If I had known I was going to have to bust my head this hard, I would have taken high school more seriously and not skipped so many classes and so much homework. Not to mention all the other stuff I pulled. I know Theo wasn't the kind of person who'd wind up in the middle of a street fight or the back of a cop car like Dad thinks. But I didn't know he could charm my dad this way. Phone, mom. I let her go to voicemail. We're bringing, um, then I text her the picture with a message. We're bringing my friend Theo. Mom's not as freaked out about dad as about this. Do you got a job lined up, Theo? Dad asks. Not yet, but I'll have to find work because there aren't many scholarships for a guy like grades like mine. I I'm glad you came with, dad tells Theo. Ben wanted to ask Todd, but I encouraged him to invite you instead. Atticus barks. Sounds like a liar to me. So what's the story with this trip? We're going to rescue a dog. Cool. I like dogs. Why do you got to take a road trip to get a dog, though? Can't you just pick one up in the pound around here? This one needs us. Read the email I got. Read it out loud so Ben can hear it, too. This six-month-old border collie was found on the side of the free raid, skinny and dehydrated. Paw pad scraped raw from the asphalt. Uh, it's urgent we find a home because we're overcrowded as soon as possible. Whoa, rough start for a little guy. You can say that again. I had border collies when I was growing up. One saved my life. Pulled me out of the street. Kept me from getting hit by a car when I was a kid. Promised myself I'd never be without a border collie. Hey, a picture. Theo holds it up for me to see. Border Collies can smile, but this one has a big dopey grin that breaks me right down the middle. Especially to think of such a sweet pup had been dumped. Approximately 4 million cats and dogs are put down each year because of overpopulation. Man, I had no idea. I swipe my burning eyes and glare at Dad. I'm glad you're making this trip for the dog. Spending time with you, though, is not going to fix anything between us. Noted, says Dad. How long are we going to be gone and where are we headed? Theo ignores the bad vibes between Dad and I. I left a note for my brother that I was taking off with you guys. I should text him a couple of the details. A couple of days there and back, said Dad. Don't let him fool you. We'll be lucky to roll back in town by Labor Day. 
Ben thinks I'm too impulsive to be trusted on the road, says Dad. Well, maybe it would have been a bad thing if you had prepared a little bit before taking off. How? Uh, maybe get the truck serviced? Truck runs fine. It's a simple trip. It's almost boring. Dad is a lot of things, but he's never boring. I hope I'm wrong worrying. There's nothing I can do except buckle my seatbelt and hope for the best. I sit back and throw an arm around Atticus. He looks out the window like he's driving. Yep, nothing but smooth sailing from here on out. Atticus, for one page again, of the dog. I wonder what the cat is doing right now. If I'm not around, the cat always sharpens the claws on the couch. And I'm the only one who gets upset at this. I'm not allowed to bite. People yell if I snap at the cat, but I bare my teeth and the cat knows I mean business. It's probably sleeping in the sink, which I also don't allow, or sitting on the kitchen table licking the butter. They always forget to put the butter back in the fridge. A dog is going to be a lot of work for me. Maybe we'll keep the smelly, smoking boy, big boy Theo, too, instead of the dog. And forget about the whole new dog. Uh, he's keeping my boss and the boy talking. He's good for us. And he reached up, scratched the itch for me he saw when I couldn't quite reach the right spot behind my ear. He's good people. I can tell. My boy thinks Theo doesn't care that he's getting along with the boss. He does, though. I feel him tense up when they were talking, even though he pretended not to see what was going on. He knows. I know that he knows. Yep. You done thrown a rod. So this is a new chapter. Nothing but smooth sailing. So now they jump. And that's a mechanic talking to them. Telling them about how their car broke down. Yep, you done thrown a rod. That sounds bad. I ain't good, mister. This here truck's in terrible shape. I glance at Dad from the other side of the open hood. We're all staring at down at the engine. We've barely left home. And we're already standing in a garage with a busted truck. And it makes us feel hopeful that the universe has stepped in and put an end to Ben's quality time with Dad. To call you three people would be an insult to stupid folks. Dummies like you drive their trucks into the ground. You're hopeless. I've seen a lot of nimrods like you. Always come when it's too late and then you whine and complain about how much it's going to cost. If you had taken care of this truck, you wouldn't have wound up with your bottoms in a sling like this. I, I, you can't tell any, anyone anything these days, said the mechanic. Theo and I exchange a look, and then he slides between me and the mechanic. Does this guy think he's going to take a swing at Dad for me not taking care of the truck? He might have a sick sense about upcoming fights, but he probably knows I'm not good with conflict. Unless it's on the ice, then I'm fierce. You sure it's that serious, Dad asks? Of course I'm sure. I've had my set inside an engine since I was old enough to stand on a wooden crate. I know everything there is to know about engines. And when I say you done thrown a rod, you can take it to the bank. You done thrown a rod. We were making such good time. Yeah, nearly 20 miles before the truck down broke down, I said in my sarcastic voice. Mechanic. This per, his patch says Gus. You know you ain't going to go farther than 20 miles for a long time, right? I get the feeling we're in for a delay when the truck started sounding like someone was hitting an empty aluminum garbage can with a hammer. How long will it take to repair? I hold my breath. It's not a repair. You got to rebuild the whole engine. This is not what Dad had said about flipping businesses. He, no one can fix anything anymore. They're all completely redoing. Gus keeps talking. This this ain't no tune-up. I'm going to have to put in new crankshafts and rod bearings, maybe pistons. Lots of times the whole thing has to be rebored. We're talking new rings at least. Going to have to order the parts first, which might take us as long as a few weeks. Can't keep everything I might need on hand, you know. Weeks? We can have the dog shipped to us since Dad and I won't be bonding on the road. And maybe I can stay at Theo's or Todd's until Mom and Dad settle down. Or until school starts. Whichever comes first. Bad news. We're going to pick up a border collie and I was looking forward to meeting a little dude. He tells Gus. One of them black and white dogs that herds sheep? Theo nods and jerks his head towards Atticus and the cab. Is that dog ignoring us? Probably. He's annoyed. 
I don't think he was too happy with the noise the truck made. Gus chuckles. He's embarrassed by what a fool uh, your dad is with his vehicles. Smart critter. Why'd you want another one if you already got this one? We're on a Border Collie rescue list. When one's been abandoned or needs a home, there's a bunch of us who'll take them in. Atticus was in the truck. He was once a rescue dog once, too. That there dog is sizing me up, ain't he? I nod. Looks like he's baring his teeth, but I know what a smile looks like. I like to see a smile now and then. Nice fellow. Yeah, Atticus is nice once you get to know him. What happens to those dogs if you rescue people don't step in? Well, they usually put them down. Oh man, I don't like the sound of that. I never had a dog myself, but that's not right. Yes, that's why our family fosters Border Collies. We keep them until they find homes. This one, though, we're keeping. He's going to be mine. Gus nods and starts to say something, but he's cut out by an awful noise. A bunch of beeping. Beep, beep, beep. Someone's punching a car horn. We jump in surprised. I look next to me. He'd gone poking around in Gus's lot while we were talking. He's nosy. I should have expected he'd wander off and explore. Um, Atticus climbs out of the truck and ambles down me, and his head is down. Like me, he's not looking forward to seeing what Dad has gotten himself into now. He's sitting behind the wheel of an old school bus. I took that bus and had trade for a while ago. Didn't know uh, what I was going to do with it besides maybe start a fine rust collection. But who can pass up having their own personal bus? Very cool, says Theo. Yeah, I made it hum. I made it brand new. Works great. Do you need a special driver's license? Yeah, I never drove it though. Where am I going to drive a bus? Too bad. I bet it's a sweet ride, said Theo. Dad comes bouncing out of the bus, greeting from ear to ear. I get the feeling I'm going to have to keep an eye on your old man, says Gus. Worse than a bull in a china shop. Man, not that that guy you want to trust too much with rope, because sooner or later you're going to feel him tripping you up, said the mechanic. Yeah, pretty much. But how did he under manage to understand Dad so quickly? I'm a good judge of people. Gotta be when you work for yourself like I do. Gus, Atticus, and I watch Dad and Theo walk around the bus kicking the tires. We'll take this as a loaner while you're fixing our truck, says Dad. The heck you will! I will never let a complete stranger who can't take care of his own vehicles borrow my bus. I've always wanted to drive a bus, says Dad. Even got my license for it a few years back. This way is better than the pickup. It's a statement. We support education and border collie rescue. What's the gas mileage on this thing? I'll be mostly freeway driving once we get out of here. Uh, is he hard of hearing? No. We can put a banner on the rear window. Border collie or bust. N-O. You can come with. That's my voice. Dad's look at me and he beams. Even Theo smiles. Gus studies the ground. I'm the only one who seems surprised by what I said. What was I thinking? No one can ever say I don't pull my own weight. I work seven days. You don't work, you don't eat. Don't believe in namby-pamby stuff like trips. No. Atticus leans against his head, his head against his leg to be petted. Gus ruffles Atticus' ears and he nods. From petting the dog, he makes up his mind. All right, someone's got to be there to check the oil. Make sure you don't get that. Make sure you get that dog in time. I don't like the thought of you two boys in the care of a man who doesn't look after his own vehicles. I'm going to get my toolbox and lock up. We introduce ourselves and we collect our stuff from the pickup and climb in the bus. Gus tosses Dad the key and sits where he can keep an eye on him. Toolbox in his lap. Theo and I flop down across from the aisle from each other. Your dog's looking at me like I'm sitting on the spot that's got his name on it, but I ain't moving, says Gus the mechanic. Turn on the engine. What's so hard about that? Touch a motor, right? She sings for you. Even Atticus seems high, seems to sigh and settle back. Dad adjusts the mirrors and studies the dashboard. He backs up a few feet slowly, getting the feel of the bus, carefully maneuvering between the cars. He gets pointed toward the street without crashing in anything. If I can fix anything, this fella can drive anything, guess God says. I can tell. He's got the touch. Dad turns on the street without running over the curb. 
Then he guns the engines and we're down the road. Gus throws his head back and laughs. Well, all right then. Theo and I high five. We watch Dad weave through the city streets and get on the highway. Atticus moves over to sit with Gus. I take their picture. Atticus smiles, but Gus does not. I take a photo of Theo, too. And I take a self-portrait, but no photo of Dad. I text the picture of Gus to Mom. We made a new friend after the truck broke down. She's going to go out of her mind trying to figure out who the stranger is and what happened to the pickup truck. Excellent. Like clockwork, Dad's phone rings. He can explain Gus and the bus to Mom. Dad's probably going to use up all his minutes this month before lunch. Want some popcorn, I asked, digging through? Cheese or caramel? I have both. Caramel. Snacks are important. I toss bag a, a Theo a bag of mini donuts. Amen. Gus rips into his popcorn. How did you wind up owning a garage, Gus? Gus, that's the only thing I'm good at. I'm not sure what I'll be good at, said Theo. Well, you're 14, right? Sooner or later, you'll know. You find yourself where you're supposed to be without noticing how you got here. Theo says, man, I hope so. That sounds like a sweet deal. It ain't easy. You got to work for it. You a good worker? Well, I am now. It wasn't always. You two brothers? We're friends, said Theo. Your fool is going to... Your fool pa is going to run us off the road if he doesn't stop yapping on that phone and start watching the road. Dad straightens out the bus and salutes Gus in the mirror. Where's your mom? How come she ain't here too? My father spent our say... Why? I can't see myself saying out loud, though I think it in my head. Oh, my father spent our savings on some house-flipping, get-rich-quick scheme, and I'm not talking because he screwed me out of hockey camp, and my mom is glad we're gone. Last thing we need here is a woman, says Gus. This bus is going to remain woman-free. Last page, Atticus's voice. I like the bus. The truck felt crowded with Theo. It's usually just the boss, the boy, and me. I have my own seat, and I'm able to walk up and down the aisle and go to side to side of the windows. It's important to be able to see everything all the time. Maybe we'll forget about this dog, and we'll just start picking up new people. It's a better idea. Maybe um, the man who smells the grease acted like he didn't want to come along but he wanted to come along the whole time. He got on the bus quick. Now he's looking at my boy and the boss and Theo out of the corners of his eyes. He thinks no one notices, and he smiles with his eyes. He smiles with his eyes, and that is always real. All right, we did it. I'm late for class, but we made it to page 39. And if I read quickly and you missed any part, just go back. And watch it.